Good morning, Jay First Baptist Church. It's so good to be with you this morning. Uh, this is the War Wednesday broadcast for the morning. We probably will have a broadcast this evening also. It'll be later. We're going to be having a deacons meeting and for today, and I'll probably do an extra broadcast on Thursday as well as Saturday, just quick ones, just explaining and, and reiterating what we're going to be doing for the next couple of weeks. Tonight, we're going to have our regular deacons meeting. We're not going to be doing it Sunday morning. And we're going to be deciding uh, and, and talking about how we're going to continue, at least for the next couple of weeks. Uh, this coming Sunday, as far as I know, tentatively, we are planning to open up uh, um, uh, to have a morning service here on the campus. Uh, we, we're going to be discussing this, though, because of the uptick that has been happening around us. And um, we're going to be talking as our leadership group as far as the... Um, Deacons and myself and all of our staff is going to be there too, the, the ministerial staff. So we're going to be doing that. Keep us in prayer for this evening. A um, couple things. Uh, we, have, we, we are seeing a couple more cases, but let me just share something with you about the, how the, the numbers are going um, according to how the, how the, I guess, the health departments around the state report. Uh, the number that we have, I think, is now over 100. That's the cumulative number. Now let me explain this because this was explained to me by a person in the health department of Santa Rosa County. He said that that's the cumulative number. So a number of these people in our case, in our county, have been um, cleared, meaning they've gone through this and they are now cleared, which is great. And um, so we don't have 100 plus people in our town with COVID walking around. And, and most of the people are, are distancing. They're, they're, they've been very, very good about this. Most people, when they get this, they, they self-distance. They self-isolate uh, uh, themselves, which is very important. Um, and th there have been a number of people that have either had it um, or they've been exposed and they do the, they do the quarantining. And the ones that have had it, um, we've had we've had a couple deaths, which is always sad pertaining to this. And we do lift up the uh, the the Davis family for the loss of Sam this the, the, this week, and um, our prayers go out to that family. Um, uh, Sam was a great member here at our church, but uh, but as far as what's happening around us, we do see that the prison system has seen a lot of an uptick, um, and especially the prison over in Century. That was reported. That's not something that's secret. That was re re reported in, in the news. And um, so we're not seeing like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds in the northern part of the county all of a sudden all becoming sick. Um, the, the numbers are most of them are, are cumulative. Now there are certain pockets, and as I said, the prison does have quite a few cases there. And uh, when you're in an isolated setting like this and you're limited to where you can go, I can understand that. That's why many times even in a nursing home, it can, it can be very, very problematic. And uh, we, uh, we just lift up our nursing homes in the area. We have a couple here that are very good. We have one in Century. We also have the Terrace here. We, 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 we pray that the workers as well as the residents stay safe there. Um, so uh, what's going on? Well, we're going to be meeting a lot. Uh, we're going to be meeting this evening, all of the deacons, as I, as I said, and the staff, and we're going to be uh, discussing how we continue forward. I know in other parts of the country, and there's one pastor in particular, it was mentioned to me earlier today, it's John MacArthur. He's in California. Um, his church has decided to, to start a meeting. Now, here's, here's your crux. Um, don't, don't watch CNN for this. CNN is a wicked organization that does not report news. They report an agenda, and they will twist anything that is said by any truth, in, in any truth, and they will make it a lie. Um, of the news media, Fox is really about the best one. That's, that's being as unbiased as possible. Uh, but if you're uh, if you want to read about and, and hear about John MacArthur, the truth, go to YouTube, 
and type in John MacArthur and church in COVID-19. You'll get plenty of the, of the YouTubes in his words being allowed to explain what they are doing. They are allowing um, all sorts of protests going on in California. Yet the governor has said we're going to lock down all churches. And yet the protest, there's no mask wearing, there's, there's no distancing in this. And uh, John MacArthur's position with his elder board. He is, I believe, a uh, Bible church, if I'm not mistaken. I might be wrong on that, but he's not a Baptist church, but he's a Bible church. And he has a seminary there, a Bible college connected to his church, a very large church. He has been doing it right for m many, many years, all of my adult life, I think over 50 years there. And um, he is a solid Bible teacher, preacher. He cares about his, con his, his congregation. They, they do great, great service for the Lord in his community in, in, I believe it's in Orange County, California. And he is one of the great Christian leaders of our time. Well, they have decided to open. They've had two, two uh, church meetings. They are addressing the coronavirus. They're doing it uh, within great bounds. And we need to lift him up in prayer because the county could go after him, find the church $1,000 a day, as well as uh, put him in jail. Um, this is not the same as the gentleman who was in Tampa at the beginning of this virus coming on and, and we started to lock down uh, that, that Brown. Uh, Rodney Brown is a total opposite end of this. He did everything he did to make a name for himself. And he, he basically uh, put his nose up against the, uh, against the city and he, he, his motives were very, very unbiblical and ungodly. Dr. Dr. MacArthur is a different person altogether, and their church is doing it very differently. So, so let me just encourage you. Um, if you hear about this uh, news media, I, I, none of the news media much, except Tucker Carlson did an interview with, with uh, John MacArthur. That was a pretty good interview. But for the most part, go to YouTube. You can find John MacArthur actually being able to talk and share his view on this. Uh, we need to pray for his church. And, and we need to pray for the, for the setting of our nation. Early on, I, I've, I've been a one who has spoken out and said, this is not an attack against the church. Now it's becoming an attack against the church in many areas. We need to lift up our governor in prayer because our, our governor is not put any stipulations on the church. In fact, just the opposite. He's protected the church. Our president of the United States is wanting to protect the church. They at least understand um, that that the church and the, the spiritual well-being of people is very important. And right now, as a church, we, to, we and Jay, you know, you might say, well, Jay, Jay's just a little town, you know, up in northern Florida, northwestern Florida. What can we do? Well, we can make a difference in our community. And as Christians, yes, I believe in social distancing. I believe in wearing a mask. And in fact, when we start back, I'm going to encourage all of us, you need to wear a mask. If you don't have a mask, we're going to get some masks and we'll have them available. Um, uh, and we need to practice our social distancing uh, as, we, as, as we wait on this. Because we have so many in our church that are in that higher risk category. And if we're, if we're meeting... I want to protect them, just as John MacArthur wants to protect his congregation. And as your pastor, my main, my main concern is your spiritual well-being and your spiritual health. But secondly, my, my concern is, is your physical well-being. You know, I didn't come up here just to do a job. When we moved to, to, to Jay, Florida, we moved our heart up here. And I care about our, our membership, and I care about our members. And this is very important. So let me just encourage you. Um, we just need to uh, we just need to carry on, and and do what's right in that area. Um, one of the other things too that's very disturbing lately is we are now seeing seminaries that are caving in to this uh, to the social justice that is being promoted that is very anti-biblical. And today's text is going to be out of Isaiah chapter 29. Isaiah is one of my favorite books. In fact, my dissertation was on Isaiah 53. And um, the comparison of, uh, of that passage referring to Christ 
and comparing it to what the writers of the Talmud said. But in chapter 29 of Isaiah, there's a warning given by God, and this is God speaking. And he says, Woe to Ariel, to Ariel the city where David dwells. Add your year, add you year to year, let them kill sacrifices. Uh, this first verse in chapter 29, Ariel is, this, is another name for the city of Jerusalem. So Jerusalem and where David dwells, meaning that's where David established his the kingdom of Israel and the and the seat of power or the or the king's um, throne there and from then on it it, it continued on and, and Jerusalem was the city and then of course David desired to 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 build the temple God said he couldn't because he was a man of war his son built it but he did buy the land where the temple was was standing until it was destroyed finally and that's that's the temple mount where the dome of the rock is today but this is going to be a woe. And when, when God says woe, that's that's a pretty serious statement. And verse 2, Yet I will distress Ariel, and there shall be heaviness and sorrow, and it shall be to me as Ariel. Basically, Jerusalem, and you have to, you have to place this in history. Isaiah is, is on the scene before the fall of, of Israel to the Babylonian Empire. And during this time, Israel had become, and in the, in the southern kingdom, or Judah, had become more and more distant from the things of God. They started to add in, at this time, a lot of um, traditions and other things. And they were getting away from truly serving the, the, the Lord and, um, and doing it right. And they, they might not have been uh, doing idolatry, pract uh, idolatry practices in the open, but they were getting away from God, and they were making wrong choices. And if we apply this to, to today's world, um, even the greatest seat of, of what we would say the closest group to God, we're talking about Jerusalem, we're talking about the city of God, and this city was going to had a great woe against it because the people of this city were making wrong choices. They were not lining up with God, and we need to be careful about this too, even in our world today. And I worry about some of our seminaries. In fact, one in particular, a Southern seminary. This is a Southern Baptist seminary. And there for a while, for a number of years, they had grown farther and farther away from God and the godly principles. And they had a new president come in. And this president uh, actually guided them back toward uh, being a fine, fine seminary. Well, it's changing. They have let go seven professors that are very traditional, conservative, Bible believing and teaching professors there and they are aligning themselves with with this this social garbledly group today that is being professed all over and it's not a good thing when students are being told you have to be globalist stop we have to be biblicist if a pastor is going to do it right he needs to be Bible grounded not globally grounded it's good to know about what's going on around the world that's important. I feel I think that is, but that's only second to being biblically solid and sound. And they're not preaching and doing this, and they're not teaching pastors this, which is not good. Not all their teachers, but some of their teachers. And this is our denomination, and this bothers me greatly because what that means is, is students are going to come out of there that are going to go to churches, and people are going to be told things that may sound great, that are getting farther and farther away from the Lord. We need to be careful with that. Here at J First Baptist Church, we're not going to do that as long as I'm pastor here. And I pray that we, as a church together, we hold to the solid things of the Lord and that we stay close with Him. Um, and this just isn't at, at, at a couple of our seminaries. That's This is at other seminaries too. One I graduated from, uh, Trinity Evangelical D Divinity School. They are also seeing this and they're promoting this heavily and this is not a good thing. It's not biblically, biblical in nature. And God continues in verse 4, And you shall be brought down and shall speak out of the ground, and your speech shall be low out of the dust, and your voice shall be as of one that has a familiar spirit out of the ground, and your speech shall whisper out of the dust. What God says is you're going to be brought down. You're, you're, it's not going to last forever. I'm not going to allow error, even in Jerusalem. And what happened? We know when the Babylonians came in, they attacked three times. 
first time they attacked, they left all the buildings and all the structures intact. They left the society intact. They took all of the princes. Daniel was taken then. The second time they attacked, they once again left the structure, the infrastructure, the buildings. They put heavier taxes. They put up their puppet king, and they took the builders at that time. And that's when Ezekiel went. Then the third time, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar was just so infuriated, he said, destroy it all. And they did. They leveled it. They took most of the people into captivity. That was the time of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was released because he actually prophesied that Babylon would come. And basically, um, with that prophecy, the Babylonians released him, and he was taken down to Egypt. And he, and he, he wept over the city of Jerusalem. So this was a prophecy that would be fulfilled uh, very shortly after the time of Isaiah. In verse 5, Moreover, the multitude of your strangers shall be like small dust, and the multitude of the terrible ones shall be as chaff that passes away. Yea, it shall be at an instant suddenly. Basically, the enemy and the ruthlessness will be short, but it will happen, and then it will be done. And you shall be visited of the Lord of hosts with thunder, and with earthquake, and with great noise, with storm, and tempest, and flame, and devouring fire. This is going to be a terrible time. And the great Babylonian captivity hurt Israel greatly. It never was the same nation after that. Up until that time, it had gotten smaller and smaller and less, and less important in the world. Of course, the time of, uh, of the king, was so king Solomon, it was one of the greatest nations in the world. Very small, but very great. Well, that greatness has gone away. Uh, once again, Israel is a, is a focal point, but not because they are such a great, great nation in the eyes of the world. It's because I truly believe they are God's chosen people and Satan wants to destroy them. And the multitude, verse 7, of all the nations that fight against Ariel or Jerusalem, even all that fight against her and her munition and that distress her, shall be as a dream of a night vision. Meaning, eventually Jerusalem will stand, and it will stand at the end. It shall even be as when a hungry man dreams, and behold, he eats, but he awakes, and his soul is empty. Or as when a thirsty man dreams, and behold, he drinks, but he awakes, and behold, he is faint, and his soul has an appetite. So shall the multitude of the nations be that fight against Mount Zion. One of the great promises of God, that the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of, the, of his chosen people, even though they made wrong choices, even though he had to, in his mindset, perfect mindset, uh, punish and bring them back, when it's all said and done, Israel still will stand, Jerusalem still will stand. And we're seeing that today in all of the attacks against them. What does this mean for us? It means this. It says, I think in our nation, and I don't equate our nation with Israel, but our nation was founded on Christian principles. And we just, uh, we need to understand that we can't make wrong choices in society as a whole and in, in a large amount and not expect problems to come. So what, what do we do as a church? I'm not trying to disturb you or get you upset today, but what I'm going to, what I'm telling you is we need to, as a church, be on our knees, praying for our nation, our nation national leaders. We need to pray for our leaders in Christian, in Christian work, in our, in our for our seminaries, for our pastors, for those in our community, maybe not even your own pastor, pray for him, but also pray for the other pastors in town. Because every single pastor has to, has, to, has to make a decision. Do I stay biblical or do I do it in a way that, that I think brings in people or makes, it, makes this message so important? It's not biblical. It's not right to do. Bottom line. I don't care what certain, certain logistical ways people do things or say things. If it's not biblical, don't do it. And we need to be careful in that. And sometimes we, uh, even a church leader, even, a, even a, a professor at a seminary, get caught up in something that's not biblical. And they will promote it as, this is the truth. Well, if it's against the Bible, it's not the truth. We need to pray for our president. We need to pray for our, our governors. We need to pray for those in our nation. And we need to live Christ before our community. That's the important part. And in this case... This was a prophecy that was fulfilled with the Babylonian Empire.
But then part of this prophecy, where Israel still stands and Jerusalem still stands, they are still standing today. They are not going away. And the good thing about Isaiah is the first part is the woe section in Isaiah. The second part of the book start, talks about what will happen in the millennial kingdom and how Christ is going to reestablish Israel and, and, and make it a great nation once again. And, and I believe that. I believe in a literal end time scenario. So let me encourage you, God's still in control. Even though you see churches like, like uh, John MacArthur's church in California taking it on the chin, they're trying to serve God in the right way. John MacArthur and his elder board is doing it right. Others around our nation are taking it on the chin as far as churches because there are certain individuals who are government leaders that do not like the church. They are, they are pawns of Satan. And they are trying to destroy the church. But then in other areas, and we're very fortunate to live in a state with a governor who does keep it open so that we can make the right decisions in serving the Lord. And I appreciate that. Uh, one thing before we close in prayer, uh, we are going to be having tomorrow, that's Thursday at 9.30, uh, we're going to be having the Jolly Jays meeting. We are going to do social distancing Matt Dobson is going to be speaking for us. He's going to be representing the Santa Rosa Health Department. He'll be dealing with um, and talking about the COVID-19 and how we can work to, to protect ourselves from, from problems from that. He's also going to be dealing with um, preparedness for hurricane season, as well as the flu, uh, pneumonia, and the shingles, and the vaccines that are available for that, and especially how that will affect our seniors. So if if you fit in this area, this might be a good one to come and visit. There will be no meal, but uh, we're going to be providing some snacks that are prepackaged so that we can uh, we'll, we'll maintain our distancing and safety in that. So please come for that if you're able to. And uh, let's, let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you once again, and we do thank you for the great opportunities you give us. And Lord, I ask for your comfort. I ask for your comfort not just uh, in the hardest of times, and we lift up the whole Davis family for the loss of Sam. But we also know, too, that Sam knew you as Savior and that he is now in the glories of heaven. And that is our hope, that one day we'll get to see him again as Christians. But I ask for your comfort now, because it is hard when, when we lose a loved one. And there have been others, a few others in our community lately that have gone to be with you. We lift up their families. We ask a special blessing on, on Doyle as, uh, as he's waiting on, uh, on a surgery. And, and Lord, I just ask that, that when all this happens, that the doctors have greatest of skill and that he can uh, recover quickly from, from this. And, and, and we lift up others in our church, too, that have struggled with various illnesses. We lift up uh, Brother Josh, who, who, whose family has been struggling with the COVID-19 and and may you just allow them to heal quickly and be back up on his feet as, pa as a co-pastor here in our town. And we lift all this up before your name and before your throne. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. God bless and shalom.